You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. The day I spent with Heath Ledger, you know, six months before he died, you know, the, the photos we created, the guy that I got to see and spend six hours with is what I remember. I did 18 videos with Rihanna. You know, I worked with, with you know, the Beckham sort of David for 20 years and, and worked with Snoop for 10 years and Jay-Z for a long stretch. He would smoke out one person from my crew every shoot. So if I was doing stills and I had four guys, one of them would be down because you could, no one can outsmoke Snoop. It's just like, and he, his, his favorite thing would be like, he'd, he'd take a blunt and be like, all right, man, like that. He'd say it to my assistant. And, and he, the assistant would look at me, I'd be like, yeah, okay, it's cool, go ahead. So he'd light it, take two puffs, hand it back. Snoop's like, man, I told you to light that. I'm like, okay, two more, two more. And, the, and then two seconds, <laughs> the guy's out. And that was his favorite thing. I mean, every artist on the planet has had a mental breakdown. Don't think for a second. Any single person at that level has had a moment. And depending on how long that moment lasts, whether it's a day, an hour, a month, a year, or five years, they, people have, it's impossible to live in that, in that light all the time. I did um, Irreplaceable, you know, and that was in 2006. I did another video after, and then my relationship with her was really just around Jay, but they're just, great people man can't say enough about them you know just beautiful people and you she is what you see you know she's a strong woman she's a leader she's a mother she's a wife she's an artist she's an icon I, mean, I think she's the greatest performer of all time um i think with M, it was it was the, what i noticed more than anything was that he was pretty much like a recluse you know we would have to go to detroit and go out to his house to work you know he would always work in these like small communities where he lived you couldn't get him to come to la and work you know you always had to go to him Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Anthony Mandela. How are you, brother? Pleasure to be here, man. Absolute pleasure to have you on. Yeah, man, it's my honor. Absolute legend. Like you've worked with some of the biggest names on this planet, from Rihanna, Eminem, Jay-Z, Beyonce. But the list is long, but it's phenomenal, the work that you've done. You also released The Monst Monster on Netflix as yeah. well. Yeah, and Surrounded coming yeah. next year. That's fucking great status. Like, Thanks, started man. off as a photographer. I did, I did. And now you're... You're here working with the biggest names, traveling the world. Like, fair play to you, mate. And I take my hat off to you. Proud of you. Um, like everybody wants to be the biggest and the best, and and your name's out there as being the biggest and the best to work with. Like, it's an honor to have you on. Hey, man, it's my pleasure. I um, I came across your podcast just randomly online, and I reached out to you, and just love the honesty. You know, we start a conversation and just the ability to come here and sit down with you and talk while I was in town is my honor, man, because we all as creatives or as people or as, you know, no matter where our journey is, we all want to be able to express ourselves. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate and, and, that. And it's been a long journey, you know, and listen, there's a lot of losses along the way, you know, like uh, a lot of wins and a lot of L's, as we say, um, years that are great and years that are terrible, pieces that are remarkable and memorable and other ones you, you, you sort of duck your head down and wish you didn't do that. And that sort of creative process is a journey, you know, so I'm happy to be where I am today. You know? Yeah, fair play. Before we get into everything, brother, I always go back to the start with my guests. Where did you grow up and how it all began? I grew up in LA in the, like the seventies and eighties in a time um, that was really interesting because it was very creative. My mother was a, a filmmaker and a producer and a writer. My father owned restaurants. And I really grew up in like, when you think about LA at that time in the eighties, I was like one of those kids, like Beverly Hills, 90210, Less Than Zero, you know, Fast Life, you know, um, Hollywood, like in that era, movie stars. And it was interesting because you walk down the street and be like, oh wow, there's Arnold Schwarzenegger, or there's Sylvester Stallone, or there's Cindy Crawford, or, you know, you, you, it was around you all the time. And I think it had a big influence on um, my desire to be in Hollywood and, and to make movies, especially my mother as an artist. And, um, you know, I went to film school and, and started my journey young as a, as a filmmaker and sort of failed. Nothing happened, you know, 22, 23, 24, trying to get things done and almost and maybe and ended up in coffee shops or writing all day. And I think my parents were really concerned that I was going to be that guy and, and told me to get a job. And, and I started taking pictures and, and shooting headshots and model cards and, 
little by little editorial and and then that started a whole process of like a photo career essentially you know and how was that to get into that was that always your passion or was that something you just watched no. your mom doing well no film was always my passion being a director but being a photographer was you know the problem with film at that time was that you you know it was it, there was no digital so you actually you had to get a camera to get sound you need help it was two three people it's not like today you pick up an iphone you can make a movie so I picked up photography as like a way to practice because that was part of the the idea, you know, the frame. You know, the, the base of everything is the frame. So I bought a camera for my 13th birthday with my own money and kept taking pictures. And then when sort of like the film that I was trying to make didn't happen, I became a photographer and I got an agent and, you know, I was off to the races. You know, I started shooting very quickly in my mid-20s. Um, and I started coming here a lot because I eventually had a contract with British GQ and British Esquire and was working for, at that time, FHM magazine. And, you know, eventually I met David Beckham for an Adidas campaign and, and started working with musicians. And so it was a mix of music, cover, like like album covers and fashion and advertising jobs and, um, you know, shooting movie posters like for The Wire, you know, Entourage, things like that. It just started to expand, you know, and then I spent most of my 20s doing that. And then as I got back to about 30, I started directing music videos again, you know, started transitioning back into directing. How was it like working with the bigger stars? Was that, did your mom have those sort of people around you as a kid? So when you'd done it as a photographer, it didn't seem, because we can get starstruck, we can, we can, in that industry, it's kind of, it's a fucking bubble. It's a weird industry. You know that yourself, working with the biggest names. Like, how was that feeling when you started get, taking the A-listers and was that just... No, what like water off a duck's back, or was it? A yeah, no. It's, I mean, like I, I, w I was definitely like raised around a lot of like famous people, so it was less. I, I was less starstruck. It's more the expectation when you're a photographer. Let's say you're working for GQ and you're shooting a, you know, Colin Farrell, like I did for the cover of, of British GQ. You, you come in, you meet him. Hey, man, how are you? You have about five minutes, and you're like, okay, this is what we're gonna do today. You know. Um, here, turn this way, turn that way, you know, let's take your shirt off, do this. You know, you, ask, you start asking people to do things and they don't know you. So either you have to build trust very quickly and you have to be somebody that they, that's likable very fast. And some days, you know, you're having a shitty day and you're like, you're not really in the mood for it, but then you see the actor doesn't respond or the talent doesn't respond to you and you have to figure out ways to sort of get them into a place because a photo doesn't lie. It's either a great photo or not. And you can tell when people are bored. So I think the the challenge was learning how to create things very fast and change my attitude very fast while you're on set in order to sort of get people to emote. And that became the building blocks to where I am today. You know, in, in film, you step on set with an actor, a great actor, an Oscar winning actor. If, if you're mumbling and, and you're looking down and, and you're not, no, no, you gotta be right here because they, they're waiting, they want direction. They wanna know that you understand the character and they wanna communicate, you know? And if you're sort of like your energy's all over the place, you're gonna get that back from them, right? Yeah. yeah. How do you know you've took a great photo, or a, do you have a feeling? Like if I do a podcast, I walk away, and I feel, you just know you've 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 nailed that. You know you've you've done the best that you can because even though people tell you you're doing great, you've got a great podcast. The majority of the podcasts I do, I walk away and think, "Fuck, I should have done more. I could have done that." I'm yeah. self-loathing, and I get down. Yeah. I get a little bit depressed because I, I think I could have done more. Yeah. But then when it's out, people go, oh, "That was amazing." You're thinking, "Really?" Like you, you look. I look for the flaws and the negative sometimes. Did you do that as the photography? Did you know you took a good photo or a good shoot, or did you always have the self-doubt you could have done more? I think it's the same thing that you feel. I think you know there are moments that are magical, and you look at it; and it's iconic. You know, it's, it's someone cuts their hair or somebody wears a piece of fashion or there's just a look and a feel and you're like, that's it, you know? But like anything, it's a cycle and, and some things stand the test of time and other things you look back at six months later and you go, hmm. You know, I'm looking at work now 20 years ago. It's like the 20 year anniversary of certain things I did. Shoots with Heath Ledger, you know, shoots with Snoop that I did like around 2001, two and three. And there's like a lot of like 20 year anniversary of those photos. And, and some of them really stand the test of time and other ones look dated. But at but the end of the day, like it's about the memory of the moment and the exchange between two artists that I remember the most. You know, the, the day I spent with Heath Ledger, you know, six months before he died. You know, the, the photos we created, the guy that I got to see and spend six hours with is what I remember, you know. Same thing is true about the, you know, Russell Crowe's like a maniac, you know, and that time in life, you know, around Gladiator, 
you know, the day right before the Oscars, you know, when his energy was all over the place and my dog was with me. And so he loved my dog. And so he was calm. You know, the, these are the things you remember and the photos hopefully stand up to that, but it's that it's two sides of the relationship. It's the experience and it's the art that comes out of it, you know, and, and sometimes you have a, a strong client, like a magazine that doesn't want you to do and push this way. And so you've got to pull it back and try to re reimagine it. But, you know, it's hard to say that like everything you can do is great. You know, it is, a, we're, 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 we're learning as time goes as well. Yeah. It's good to be confident, but sometimes you can be a bit too confident and arrogant in your craft, but yeah. Heath Ledger, legend, see when you do a, a, a shoot like that and then he passes away, does that then raise what yeah. you actually did with him to, yeah i with think probably so. one of the last photo shoots of his life yeah i think so and 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 i've i've sort of not done anything else with the photos they were they were sort of run for this magazine called flaunt and there was a really important sort of shoot for me in my career um and they sort of are where they are you know it's like that's a moment people enjoy the photos they use them i let people use them they're all over the place but you know it's like you you, you touch people and have these interactions with people and then you move on you know I just made a movie with um, Michael K. Williams, who was one of my close friends who passed away a year ago of a drug overdose. Sorry, you know, yeah, from the wire, the guy mm. with the scar. Yeah, yeah. And um, Michael was one of the most beautiful people in the world, and and was and was so tortured and and so full of life and this incredible artist. And we've been, you know, we worked together on the wire. We did some advertising, and then I did something for Ciroc with him about six years later, and then we finally made this movie together. And I got a chance to like sort of really get in his process with him and and talk about sort of like this insecurity about feeling like you're a fraud. Like Michael was not this tough gangster. That's what he played. He was this soft, beautiful guy. But for me, my job was to sort of like, you know, hold his truth and help him sort of play the role. So in a way, like photography is sort of like a simple and iconic because it's an image and it can it's either great or not. But it's sort of a simple form. But as you get to film, it's a much more complicated form, right? As far as what has to be done, but you, but it's also, you know, strangely debatable. Some people respond to performances more than others, and some people respond less. You know, it could go a lot of different ways. A craft. So, see, when you're taking photos, does some of those photos shine better when you have a better connection with? Yeah. Them, if you know yeah. what I mean. Like yeah. Everything's to do with connection. Even my podcast, even like looking in the eyes, I, I get it. It's to, to connect, it's yeah. to build some sort of rapport where people can relax more and present their best self. Did you see that behind the camera where you got a great photo shoot, but part of it was because of what you also did communicating with them and not just behind the camera? Yeah, no, one thing I'm really proud of in my career is I worked with a few people a lot of times. You know, I did I did 18 videos with Rihanna. You know, I worked with, with you know, the Beckham sort of, David for 20 years and, and worked with Snoop for 10 years and Jay-Z for a long stretch. And that those repeat sort of a relationships. There's a rapport. So we sort of are building on things we did previously and there's a trust, you know, and it makes their life easier because I sort of know what to expect and, and they know what to expect when they come to set. And, and I think it makes it easier, but still the challenge is still the same. I, you still have to create something important. You still have to connect, you still have to get the job done, you know, and, and whether you're sitting for a portrait or you're doing a, you know, a big commercial, you know, there's, there's sometimes it's pure and it's just you and that person taking a picture. And other times there's 10 clients and a lot of them line, you know, and so you've got to please them and also continue the relationship with the person that brought you there. Yeah, how was he fledged as an individual? Um, the day that I shot him, he was particularly hungover, you know? So he was like, sort of like out of it a little bit. And it really worked for what we were doing. Cause it was like, a, we built this bedroom set and I just wanted him sort of laying around and drawing on the walls and sort of, you know, with his shoes off and just sort of loose and it worked. And I, and I remember him being a beautiful guy, you know, it was 20 years ago, but it was a shame you know, to lose him. You know, yeah. was a beautiful guy. What, that was 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Almost. You see a lot of tortured souls, the bigger the name, the more tortured they are. Yeah, no, I got tattoos all over me of friends that are gone, you know, some of the best ones. The best guys, you know, leave us early, yeah, you know. It's fucked up, isn't it? Because like, part of me used to chase fame. Mm. The UK, if you're a celebrity in the UK, I'm not a so-called celebrity, but if, even the big names in the UK, they're not as, as big as America. If you're a celebrity in America, you're a celebrity. Yeah. The UK, you can walk about here and nobody will know you. Yeah. In America, like, if you're famous there, you're famous all around the world. Do you see the difference between UK celebrities to American celebrities? Yeah, no, I think there's a, um, I think UK celebrities 
um, always want to hold a sort of grounded nature. Like, like fame didn't change me. And I think you feel that. I think a lot of times American celebrities, it's like the bigger, the more exclusive, the less access, the big, you know, the better. And a lot of that's the teams that are around them. And I think that um, I find uh, sort of British and even mainly UK celebrities and musicians to be really grounding and really grounded and accessible. In America, you never know what you're going to get. You know, yeah. you never know. How was it like to work with the biggest magazines on the planet? Was it a good feeling? Did you ever feel satisfied? Or was it all, you always craving more? I didn't I didn't particularly love it because every month you'd, they'd someone throw it over their shoulder and go, what's the new one? You know, it's sort of like, it was like a disposable piece of art, you know, versus a music video that would, you know, last. And now with YouTube, you know, it's like, I think my work, I've got about 10 billion views. It's unbelievable to think that, that like these pieces we created have been watched 10 billion times. You know, magazines are, you know, they get thrown over their shoulder, they don't exist anymore. So, and movies obviously live even longer. So it's, um, you know, magazines were nice, they were fun at that time. It's sort of a gone art form. What was, what was good for me in my career was that one day I would get a musician, the next day I would get a female celebrity, the next day I would get a politician, you know, you get different assignments from different magazines. So you, you had to learn a dexterity. You had to learn how to shoot a lot of different people. And I carried that through into sort of music videos and then into commercials, you know, and into film, which is like being able to talk to people, being curious. You know, that's a, a like to me the most important trait of, of anybody that holds a camera or directs. It's like yeah. be curious, ask questions, you know. To fit in kind of different faces or different places from the yeah. politician, the movie star, the music star. Yeah. But yeah. Is it just adapting to the circumstances and trying to make them feel more at ease? Yeah, and it's like you you want to be able to connect with people. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you need to be able to like with film it's different because people are playing roles. And and I sort of always did that in music videos like there was Robin Fenty and there's Rihanna, you know, there's Sean Carter and there's Jay-Z, there's Marshall Matters and there's Eminem, and there's Calvin Brothers and Snoop. There's two characters always, you know, there's Beyonce and Beyonce Knowles, right? You, you're always looking to sort of understand like what is the real person and what is the character. And if you know the real person, you can influence the character. And and so that sort of thing of like being able to talk to people, be able to understand them, be, be curious about their real life, um, ask questions, build relationships with them, it helps you guide them in their career, especially if it's someone like Rihanna, where I met her when she was 15, you know, and I did, let's say, you know, it is 18 videos, but you're over like 10 years where you're watching them grow, you're watching them change, you're watching them fall in love, fall out of love, you know, go through the hardest times, go through their biggest times, build businesses, you know, fail at businesses, become billionaires. You're like, you're like parallel watching them have this journey. You've got to be able to sort of communicate and keep a relationship with people in order to be relevant. You know, if if all of a sudden I'm not sort of I don't care about your life or I'm not into what you're saying or I'm not paying attention or I'm not all I want to do is just shoot you and keep moving, you're never going to have that relationship. You know, it's got to be a friendship. It's yeah. got to be a, like a love affair, like between in the moment. You know, like between the people you work with. So, from being one of the biggest photographers on the planet, what made you make the jump to music videos? It was kind of natural because I'd shot a couple hundred album covers, you know, and so like, I, you know, I shot like Usher Confessions and, and all the Snoop, you know, and Eminem. And, and it sort of was like, well, do you want to do videos? Yes. Okay, do that. It started slow. And then eventually there was more and more of them. It happened pretty quickly once it started. Because um, what I was doing was shooting the album cover and the videos and putting a package together. So like what you see Beyonce doing now with Lemonade and, and with their new album, which is a bunch of videos. We were doing that 15 years ago, like with artists, hard to do, hard to get people around the concept of let's do three videos, let's do a photo shoot, advertisements, marketing ideas, put the whole thing together and have a unified sort of um, concept that, that an audience could digest. As we've moved into the digital world and there's no billboards, there's no magazines and everything is sort of like, you know, in a scroll there's been a need for more unifications. Back then people were like, well, we want our photos to be like this and our videos like this. There was albums and videos didn't connect. Now everything has to work in a marketing sense. So package. You know? Yeah. Do you think, so, so if the video, see that you do a, produce a music video, see if it's such a good video, do you think that helps with views also and downloads and sales? If the video stands out as well, does that become more pressure on you to shoot a good video? Well, there's a lot of, I mean, for me, where I like to work budget wise, I mean, there's a lot of pressure because you got to perform. I mean, you know, I, I had retired from videos for a couple of years and I got a phone call from 
from um, the guy who runs Rock Nation saying, you know, look, the Jones Brothers coming back together. Do you want to work with them? And I said, not particularly. I'm, I'm retired. I'm making commercials and, and movies. And he said, well, let me send you this song. She's Jay Brown. This guy works for Jay-Z. So I heard this song, Sucker, and I was like, wow, this song's incredible. I was like, um, let me have a conversation with them. So we had a conversation. We talked creative. I put a number in front of them, like, this is what it would be. And we came over to England. We shot it here. And it was like a real spectacle. But it was like them coming back together. And I, I wasn't a particular fan of their music. I, didn't, I knew Joe, the great people. I liked them as guys. But this song connected with me. And I made a, I think, a, you know, felt like a great video when we were making it. All their wives were in it. Sophie Turner had Game of Thrones and Priyanka was exploding. It was just like this moment in time. And the video, you know, got hundreds and hundreds of millions of views. And the song was huge and sort of one plus one equals five. And they were off, you know, never looked back three years later. So, you know, you got a little part of that, you know, knowing that, that people don't really listen to the radio anymore. We watch things. The video really drives things and the image. That time. Yeah. yeah. What was it like working with Rihanna for the first time? Man, when I met her, she was 15. She couldn't walk in heels. She was like, you know, from the islands. They, the label didn't know what to do with her. Like, was she a Caribbean artist? Is she like an R&B artist? But, but I heard this song, Unfaithful, and... Um, the song was like her voice. It told me like a real story of like love and heartbreak. And I said, I got to meet this girl. And they sent it to me and I sat with her and I, and I was like, did she write this song? And they're like, no, Neo did. And I sat with her and I looked in her eyes and I saw so much depth and pain. And there was so much going on. And when she performed and sang the song, like I just, I talked to her like an actress, not like a, like stand there and sing to camera. Hey, don't look at camera perform this be in this moment we built this narrative around it and she just her and i just connected at a really deep level and i saw that there was so much more than what the label even saw and so it started a relationship where she could always trust me to to push to to allow her you know deepest part to come out you know and we we don't think about it because of where she's gone but if you go back like pre-disturbia the label really tried to get her to wear a yankees hat and make r&b rec they wanted to make her like an r&b star it's not who she was. She always knew she was going here. It was just a matter of time, you know? And actually what happened with Chris Brown was like that, that moment in time where she then had the fuel to do and just follow her path. And that's what she did. You know, look where we, you know, she's a billionaire. How is that seeing someone at 15 doing music videos with them in a relationship with, again, one of the biggest artists, Chris Brown, and, and seeing the destruction it causes it? Did, did you ever worry for Rihanna then at that time, or did you believe that she was just going to no, keep shining? No, I mean, I was, I was hanging out with them the night before, two nights before, um, and I spent a lot of time with Chris, you know, obviously. Um, and, you know, it was sometimes that young, tumultuous love goes bad. Um, I remember going to see her like a month after it happened in her house and and it was hard. I was I could see that she had changed, you know, and you don't know how people come out of that. You never know, you know. Um I've been through a lot in my life. I'm, you know, fifteen years older than her. So it's like, you know, here she is at a very young age going through something for me as a as a man like looking back saying, like, wow, if that was my daughter or sister, what would you do? How do you hold them? How do you guide them but she's she's got a fire i mean she's rihanna she's got something inside that very few she's only the only one and i saw fear in her eyes and i also saw fire you know i knew she was gonna be okay how know? did they deal with that level of fame like do you see them becoming more of a recluse as the fame keeps rising like f young girl innocent her whole life in front of her got those dreams to be a music star but then that level of fame like but you can't move out your house. Like, do you see the changes in them? Because it, it must affect you. Like, you see the childhood stars, how fucked up they are in yeah. their late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. But did you see the effects of the fame takes its toll on some of these people? It's interesting because I've been on both sides. There are certain people I work with that when I met them, they were uber famous and had 10 bodyguards. And then I watched them like change their lifestyle and have no bodyguards and actually learn how to, you know, exist out in the world without security. Other people, you watch them go from no security to having this world where they're protecting you all the time and they're moving you around. You're going from hotel room to plane, to hotel room, to show, to studio, and you're not out in the world. I used to say that to Snoop. He would go to, he, Snoop's been all over the world, never been anywhere. Been to every city in the world and never walked around. He you know, goes, goes from the plane to the hotel, 
does a show, goes back to the hotel and leaves. So you've been everywhere, but you're missing the human connection. So what happens like, what happens to your creativity when you're not experiencing life? They're experiencing things that we could never imagine. That feeling every night on stage where there's 50,000 people screaming, giving you their energy. But at the same time, they're also not, they can't stand out on the curb and enjoy the sunset as people are walking by and you know watch life happen. And so that's a that's an interesting thing. So yeah, I've, I've watched a lot of that happen. And you, you know, you try to get in people's ear and say, don't forget about this, or let's try to do this. But at some point it's too hard. You know, like with someone like Rihanna or Beyonce or Jay-Z, like it's hard to move, you know, the minute they walk on the street, yeah, everybody's eyes are on them. So they have to figure out other experiences. Yeah. How was it? How was it working with Snoop Dogg? Like, is it true the amount of weed he smokes? Like, can you get shit yeah. done? Or yeah, is it? We used to have a joke that like um, <laughs> he would smoke out one person from my crew every shoot. So if I was doing stills and I had four guys, one of them would be down because you could no one can outsmoke Snoop. It's just like, and he his his favorite thing would be like he'd he'd take a blunt and be like, all right, man, like that. He'd say it to my assistant. And and he, the assistant would look at me. I'd be like, yeah, okay, it's cool. Go ahead. So he'd light it, take two puffs, hand it back. Snoop's like, man, I told you to light that. And then, okay, two more, two more. And, the, and then two <laughs> seconds, the guy's out. And that was his favorite thing was yeah. to put people out. How is he as an individual? He's just he's just like a one of a kind, man. I love Snoop. I mean, I've spent spent about ten years in in and around him, heavy, and and he's a he's a guy that's gone comes from a very tough place and has had a lot of you know, hard times, you know, and, and people on top of him and some of his greatest music, you know, that he owns none of the rights to, you know, and, and, and go, having so many wrongs done to him, but him, his spirit is strong and he survived because he has like a real heart. He's like a loving guy. And here he is now, you know, having this moment with NFTs and web three and just bought back death row. I mean, I, I saw him like a, a couple months ago. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And I was like, man, I was worried about you. I told him I was worried about you, man, but you did it. You fucking did it. And it's, and that's a real personal thing to say, somebody like Snoop who can go anywhere, but artists behind the scenes, man, the, the, the pressure on them, the amount of responsibility, the amount of people on them, dealing with, with, with your, 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 your masters and how you get your money and, and how you get paid and your touring, it's a complicated thing to do. And it's great when you're Ed Sheeran or when you're, you know, Rihanna or or, or so or Beyonce, but everybody else is sort of fighting in the middle. Yeah, because he comes from the uh, NWA and Biggie, Tupac, like, and still at the top of his craft. How does some of them do it? Stay at the top of the craft. Even Puff Daddy, like the shit that he's been through in his life, and still ended up flying high, like losing Biggie and all the other shit that went with it, including Fifty Cent. But like, he, I think his brand went down. Yeah. Never stopped, and then he done. TV, uh, yeah. TV and yeah. become one of the biggest again. Like how, yeah. What's that link for these people to then crash and lose it all and then bringing it back to be the best again? Well, I mean, the truth is like they're not regular people. You know, they have different gears. You mm -hmm. know, Puff has a, like a, a different gear set. You know, he's like, his passion and his desire to win is like, it's infectious. If you walk in this room, his energy, you can feel it. The, the shutters move, you know? Um, not everybody's as graceful as Jay-Z. Right, Jay's graceful. Jay just knows how to move and walk in a way where, you know, he's street. He's always going to be that guy, even if he's up here. He's just, you know, he's holding what everybody wants, you know, and he's going to hold it. And he, he understands that power. And he's just, for me, the classiest. He's the Frank Sinatra. You know, he's he's the one. The Don. You know? Yeah, he's the, the the. There's Jay, and there's to me, and there's for me, there's Jay, and there's everybody else. When it comes to business, when it comes to family, when it comes to taking care of people, when it comes to loyalty, when it comes to pushing culture, Puff's incredible because he's like fireworks, you know, in a bottle, you know, and 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 one minute he's on top of the world, and then it tumbles down. And he figures how to rebuild it. I was I was there when he created Ciroc, you know, on the first campaign, first couple of campaigns when it the brand wasn't worth anything. And he had this incredible idea to basically take a whole community and and get them off of brown spirits and Hennessy and drinking and drinking vodka, which no one did. And he just figured out a way to to transfer culture. If you drink this, you're that. But if you drink this, it's high life. You know, like this is this is sexy. This is Rat Pack. This is like the good life. And and he just he just created out of nothing, and you know made a billion dollars. That's a, that's a power, man. That's that's like that's not a regular person. You know that's more than just being charming, right? Fifty is the same thing. You know, oh, came, yeah, built this huge brand, then it sort of faltered, and then got into TV, and now built another huge brand. There's certain people that like 
no matter where they are, if you put that guy in, you put those three guys in any company, they'll 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 survive and they'll thrive anywhere. You you make them a fisherman, you you they work for GM, you put them anywhere and those and and because they, they have something that's just different, you know. Yeah, if I, have to, I, I listened to his audio book and I was blown away. Like, so smart. You, you don't realize the extent and the motive. I thought it was because he's ruthless online like when he calls people out and shit. I was expecting it to be a bit of bravado, but the power that he's came from, from losing his mum to murder and um, being in prison, to him, one of the biggest artists on the planet, losing it all. I think he built it again with the water and then he became the big one of the biggest, was it movie producers? Yeah. Uh, no, TV. C TV yeah, and, and, the and on the planet. Like, to go there again, lose it and then bounce back. Like, there's, there's only a very small amount oh, of people who yeah. can do that. How did your relationship with Jay-Z start? I'll just say one thing about um, 50. I did a video in London called Hustler's Ambition for his movie. Um, this must have been 2006 or so. And I remember I came to meet him here in London for the first time. And my friend Chris Clancy, who was sort of like his point guy at the label, we're, we're at the hotel and we're about to walk in the room and Chris looked at me and goes, this guy's not normal, just so you know. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, He's not like other guys, other artists. I was like, okay, cool. It's about 11.30 at night. We go in the room and 50 lectures me about marketing for two hours without taking a breath and and literally spits like the whole plan on how he's going to do everything he's going to do. It was remarkable, remarkable. And, and, and so like a lot of times people come to the street and they survive that world. We come into show business and it's like coming to music. It's like, that's easy. There's no guns. This is easy. I'm just playing a, a game of chess here. And 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 the guys that are and the, the people that say whether it's Rihanna or Beyonce or Jay, not not male, male and female, that are best out of the ones that know that, know that this is a game of chess. Um, I met Jay um just like working in and around music and in photography and starting to work with Rihanna, you know, and, and I got a phone call that Jay wants to meet me. Um and so we sat down at the Chateau Marmont. This is about 2005, um, and had a four-hour dinner, one-to-one, -one, drank a couple bottles of wine, talked about life, film, art, culture, um, and I never forget it. He looked at me. He go, he goes like this. He goes, he goes, you're one of those guys. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, you're one of those guys. He goes, and that's, he's kind of like a guy, a few words, and I took that as a compliment. Like he felt my passion for creating and and being an artist. And we set off on this great relationship with a lot of trust and a lot of loyalty and had some great times, really great times. The, the stuff I did with him and the relationship with him was really special and dear to my heart. And, you know, we still talk a good amount and, you know, I'll see him once in a while and send him my movie and I'll get feedback and he's, he's as honest as they come, you know. Yeah, that's unbelievable, especially yeah. that kid from the street. Did he not buy the oh, New man, York Oh, man, we had times here, man. We did um, Forever Young, the video Forever Young here. Um, had a bunch of time in Lanesboro. I spent a bunch of time in London with him. My actually, my wife, me and my wife, and and B and J had a great night out um, on her tour about ten years ago. We had some good memories here. He loves it here. Yeah, how like from my kids from the streets of New York. He bought them in, in New York next to the not in Brooklyn. Yeah, <sighs> like it's, it shows what can be done. It does show what can be done. Like yeah. with fuck all. Yeah, just vision because. Even his rapping back in the day, he'll even say it was fucking shit. Like yeah. back in the day, like his old old mixtapes and the photo yeah. with the buck teeth and and now he's married to one of the most beautiful women on the planet, one of the richest musicians probably ever. Yeah. Like the amount of money he's got, obviously you've not heard about, but to have the Knicks and or and to the the talent he's got under him as well, that like, is second to none. It's I mean, it's I think it's more than money at some point. It's like cultural influence. I remember um, when they, at the Yankee, at Yankee Stadium, um, the theme of Yankee Stadium was always um, Sinatra's New York, New York, New York. And at some point they replaced it with Jay-Z's song. And I remember how big of a moment that was. Like they changed the song at Yankee Stadium to Jay's song, New York. And it's like, they're like these moments like for a young kid from the hood to have that much success, yes money, fame, wealth, power, all that stuff. But along the way, there's all these other victories, you know, and there are many times when it could go wrong. There are a lot of people that only want to hear, you know? It's like the stuff that Jay and Beyonce do, 
quietly, the charitable events, the the way they give back to the community, the way that they empower a community, the way that they've built a company and 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 employed people like it's there's nobody that's done what they've done. And it comes from a guy comes from a really, really tough place, you know, at a tough time, like 80s, 1980s in Brooklyn, gentrification, you know, New York's probably the most dangerous place in America, violent crime, police crime. It, it's just a horrible time to live, you know. And I remember I asked him one time, I was like, how many how many times in your life do you think this could this have not happened? How many big instances? And he just sort of was like, I can't, I, don't, I can't even count. Just like moments along the way where it could have gone left or right, you know, and you realize how special this guy is. You're sitting in front of someone that's a one in a billion, one in a trillion. There'll never be another, you know. Do you know when you're in the presence of somebody that they're going to be a great, they're going to be a superstar? Do you just know that like before you meet them, before their, maybe their first song or before they've hurt the heights, do you know that like meeting Rihanna, did you just know that? Not that, always, you don't always know. There are artists I, I met I worked with that you thought were going to be huge stars that didn't. There's an artist in particular that I loved, man, that had the most incredible energy and love, and he went, you know, he went to jail for ten years in the middle of his rise, and it was just it cut everything off. You know, you, you know, I met Connor, you know, probably eight years ago, seven years ago, when he was starting, really starting to go, and you, you feel it's like the energy's there, you know, guy, that guy, it's going to take. It's like with what you're saying with Patty. You know he's gonna. You don't know he's gonna be the greatest of all time, but his star is going like this. It's gonna take him really fucking up for it not to be a huge show. But you, you, there's a lot of challenges along the way because everybody is like anytime. Like if I get a call, like there's a there's a. I mean, really don't do music videos anymore. But like there's a great actor or there or there was a great musician, and you're like, okay, cool. I'm you know, I'm sure they're great. You meet them, yeah, they're cool. Or you're like, wow. That person's special, you remember them, you know? But that's like in life. It's like when the first time I met my wife. I was like, wow. I remember saying it. I was like, I said to my friend after, I was like, that girl, wow. You know, like it, it catches you. Yeah. It's that thing, you know, it's, it's, it's a feeling, you know, and it's undeniable. Some people's undeniable. What's Beyonce like? I mean, I, the sweetest, coolest, you know, I had, I had, I did, I did um, Irreplaceable, you know, and that was in 2006. I did another video after, and then my relationship with her was really just around Jay, but they're just great people, man. Can't say enough about them, you know, just beautiful people, and you, she is what you see, you know. She's a strong woman, she's a leader, she's a mother, she's a wife, she's an artist, she's an icon. I, mean, I think she's the greatest performer of all time, in my opinion. What about Eminem? Well, for me, he's the biggest and best rapper of my generation, yeah. of all time. I know he gets a lot of stick because he's a white kid, but for me, his, his lyrics are second to none. Like, yeah. How is he as an individual? Um, I did a couple videos for him, spent some time in Detroit with him, a couple shoots. He's complicated. He was complicated at that time. I, feel, I think he was not sober at that time. I think now he's sober and he seems to be really direct. But it was complicated. He's a complicated guy. you know. And his sometimes people's brilliance are is also what makes them odd, you know? And they're not like as open or as like one-to-one, -one. they don't look you in the eyes, but then they walk away and they do something that's remarkable, you know? They, they have a special skill set. Um, I think with M, it was, it was the, what I noticed more than anything was that he was pretty much like a recluse. You know, we would have to go to Detroit and go out to his house to work. You know, he would always work in these like small communities where he lived. You couldn't get him to come to LA and work. You know, you always had to go to him, which tells me something. You know, he's like, his, his world is sort of smaller and smaller. And that's, that's part of the problem is like, when you see fame sort of controlling someone's life when they actually want to do something different, you know? Yeah. It's sad, isn't it? Like, because you, you've got to be obsessed with your craft, but that becomes at a cost. Do, do you see that in the mental health of the people who are geniuses, but you also see them that don't really enjoy life as much because they're so caught up in this brilliance in their head? I mean, every artist on the planet has had a mental breakdown. Don't think for a second. Any single person at that level has had a moment. And depending on how long that moment lasts, whether it's a day, an hour, a month, a year, or five years, they, people have, it's impossible to live in that, in that light all the time. Even like for me, when I was around people at that level, even a couple days around it, you're like, wow, this is a lot. It's a lot everywhere you go. Is Snoop Dogg, Eminem, Dr. Dre type? 
Is it me? It seems like that now, yeah. That I, I, my understanding is that that relationship's good now again. Now that Snoop's bought Death Row, you know, I don't, I don't um, interact. I'm not seeing some of those guys in that room, in those rooms the same way I used to. But I think things have changed, you know, and things have gone back. There was a lot of crazy stuff going on for a long time. Yeah, it's a fucking mad industry. Yeah. But that those names is unbelievable to yeah. have worked with those names. That like, how do you feel working with these people? That like, is it just nothing now, or is it just? Or do you still get an urge to, like, a feel, like you say, a feeling like you're obviously retired now from it and no doubt everybody will still want to work with you, but do you still look back in your life and think, fuck me, like, from a kid who just started off with a camera at 13 to then yeah. producing music videos, billions and billions of you and working with the biggest names and connecting with the biggest names and the thing about yourself is you're still in contact with these names. Everybody's got an agenda. We all want to do well to elevate ourselves. But the fact that you haven't just used people to get to where you've got to and then fucked them off, the fact that you're still in a friendship, I think, tells you about your character. But do you feel what you've achieved is, like, do you know how big it is or is it just nothing now? Well, I'm starting to have the conversation. I have a seven-year-old daughter, and so we're starting to, like, watch some of my videos, and she's starting to discover that's that's what you, that's where the next wave of enjoyment comes when your children appreciate what you did and maybe who you were at one point but i'll tell you what i miss i miss um like especially with rihanna like she would cut her hair and dye it red and so we do all this work to disguise and make sure no one saw it, no pictures when we go shoot videos out in the middle of nowhere or in studio where you can control it she cut her hair dye it like the night before we do a video and then what we try to do is turn it around really quick. And you knew that like, wow, tomorrow, like there's millions of kids that are gonna be doing the same thing. You know, when I hit send here, it, 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 you shift things. There's a like whole culture just like uh, turns. And that power to sort of shift large groups is really interesting. And, and you don't feel it anywhere else. You know, I, I do a big campaign for Nike or you do a big campaign for a spirit brand or for X company and it's not the same. It's a, it's a different kind of vibration. This is like you're, like you're like plucking the string of culture, you know, and pop culture. And so whether it's America or England or India or Africa or France or, or wherever, kids are rabid about pop stars. It's been that way since the Beatles, since Elvis, right? Going all the way back. Yeah. So having your hand on that pulse is, was fun. It's yeah. mad because everything's changing now. People are famous from TikTok, Instagram. Yeah. They've not really done anything. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Back in the day, if you were famous, you were famous. You yeah. had a craft. You had, you were a genius at something. You had, there was brilliance. But yeah. now people can be, you can start a TikTok tomorrow and be the next big I thing know. within a month. Like, I know. Do you see the change and the shift that's happening? I kind of like, my stepping out of music, you know, kind of like butted into like the rise of TikTok and some of that stuff. And, and I think it, I also saw that coming and just felt like it, it was not where I wanted to be. And to be fair, like, you know, I'm 49 years old. I was doing, you know, most of my biggest work was in my 30s in music, you know, into my 40s. And at some point you sort of go like, I'm going to step out because it's someone else's time. <clears throat> and also I'm not out every night. I'm not in the clubs. I'm not like doing X, Y, and Z, where like culturally you're seeing new dances, you're seeing new styles, you're, you know, like it's time to sort of step back and let someone else have it, you know? And even, even now, like when younger artists come to me, I'm like, go find your, go find me, but next to you, go find someone that like you can build a career with, you know, go find that young filmmaker, whether it's a man or woman, a boy or a girl, man or woman, and, and go build a relationship with them like I did with these artists. You know, you don't need me anymore. You need, you need that new person, you know, and that's cool. That's like we're handing off. And I, I like that. I work with directors, you know, I've worked with several directors that became big directors. Now I'm working with a couple well-known directors and sort of helping guide them. And, you know, I've got a, um, I'll give you an example, like my friend Eve Rivera is like, Eve like was like, did all of, 50s videos and Khaled's videos and you know had a whole nother career before that and and we became friends and I was sort of done by the time he came in and he, he got to a really high level and I said man you got to get out it's time to it's kind of you got to go into film you got to go on tv and he was working and finally got his opportunity and now he directs he's directed I think 20 hours of tv mainly in 50s world the last two years and now it's time to go to make a movie and so for me like helping be on on people's shoulders say all right it's time or or i think we should go go here because it's hard you get addicted to it yeah that's what the it money comes, yeah. the, you, the the exposure the instagram people talking about you name checking you you know you get addicted to that but you've got to like life is about an evolution you know i started as a photographer 
became a video director, commercial director, movie. Now I sort of live in that world, you know, those last two sort of making movies and commercials. And, and if you don't, if you don't step away, you'll just eventually get replaced, right? That's the hardest thing is staying ahead of that curve. Yeah, it's to stay ahead of the game. I watched the Elvis film a few weeks ago and yeah. And he was breaking down. He was the most famous man on the planet and he was breaking down in his wife and saying he was just scared that people forgot him. But yeah, it was the most famous man on the planet. Like, do you see a lot of that with these superstars that like, they're scared that they're forgotten? Even though with the videos and the, the social media, they're going to be around for many, many years. That is that a fear in yeah. a lot of these big names? Yeah, I think like with actors, it's different than musicians. You know, um, we were talking earlier before we started. I wanted to bring up Michael K. Williams, um, who just released his memoir. That's a New York Times bestseller. And, and one of the things that Michael says in the book is that he always felt he was a fraud, because Michael K. always played the baddest, toughest guys from Omar on the Wire to Chalky White on, on, on Chalky White on Boardwalk Empire. You know, he always played the bad guy. You know, he had this big scar in the middle of his face, but Michael was the sweetest human being. And although he grew up in Brooklyn and grew up in a tough time, he wasn't a fighter. He was a lover, he was a dancer, he was an artist. And he always felt outwardly that he had to, to, to portray a certain thing, but inwardly he always felt like a fraud. And it's such a hard word to use because he was the most authentic guy, but that was his own demon, right? I think the same thing is true with musicians. Like the ones that have the healthiest relationships are the ones that know how to create alter egos and they can be themselves and then they can create the alter ego to do other things. So there's always a difference between like Robin and Rihanna or Sean Carter and Jay-Z or right. That's important to, to bifurcate that so that you know how to turn it off. Cause if not, you can't, I think Lady Gaga has done a good job of that. You see, she's Gaga, the performer, and then she figures out how to be an actress. She figures, you know, she knows how to turn and become other things. Balance, yeah, balance. Because if not, you just sort of like are living in. I think that's part of what happened, with like with Michael Jackson. You know, like you're sort of like you're so like who are you as a person? You're so big as a star, you can't go anywhere. You can't interact with people. You you, you revert to this childlike sort of existence, and it sort of like spirals downhill. You know it's interesting to be a man of the people, you know, yeah. very few people, big celebrities can go walk out there and know how to do it, you know? Yeah, to find that balance and imposter syndrome, it's sad to see such talents think they're not good enough or think they're being a fraud or thinking they'll be forgotten. Like, what is that then? Like, there's no amount of money or fame if you're battling up here can help you. No. Like, it's sad that people can chase that for so long, achieve it, and then they realize that they're still fucking battling. Like, yeah. did you see a lot of people getting to the top and then str struggling the most? Or does it, they struggle when they're constantly it's rising? It's both, I think, like, like we talked about, it's like, it's like it's like for you or for me, same thing, it's different things at different stages. In the beginning, it's, am I gonna last, am I good enough? In the middle, it's, can I produce the hits I produced before? But then as you get more famous, you see that it's like, what about me? Who am I? Can I have a family? Can I step away? I think the biggest challenge a lot of artists is being able to take personal time between albums to actually grow as a human being. That's a big challenge, especially in a day where they want artists to put out albums back to back to back to back. You know, and like how you look at the Beatles, like they went to India. You look at Sly and the Family Stone, he disappeared. Like, you know, their artists, you know, D'Angelo put out an album and then didn't put another one out for 10 years. Well, why? The world's waiting. Yeah. But you realize people are battling, you know, their own demons. And same thing is true, like with actors in that sense. Like you realize actors like they're always playing someone, right? Or for us as as creators. I have to, if all I do is work, I'm gonna be recycling ideas. I've gotta go and spend time with my kids, be a family man, be a husband, be a dad. I gotta go travel. I have to go inside you got to do that work in order to get better at what you do or you're not going to have you're not going to have anything new to say you're just going to be saying the same thing you know how do you find the balance then anthony what to be working with all these stars back then seeing friends dying loved ones dying biggest names on the planet like committing suicide like how do you deal with that and and try and push on to keep striving to be doing the best that you can mm. i mean i think in the other day you got to go home and you know, you got to put your head on the pillow and you got to get up in the morning and you got to do what you got to do. You know, I mean, everybody, you have to separate your story from other people's stories, you know, and that's that energy. And so whether that's working with musicians or 
making films or for me, you know, personal projects, you know, Brazil, Jamaica, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, being out in the field and, and photographing and, and documenting stories. I spent a lot of time doing, you know, for about a 10 year period, interacting with things that feel real because sometimes the celebrity thing, just like it, it, it's okay, it's not real. So it's like, that's what you're spending all your time around. How's that gonna affect you as a person? Obviously with kids, it's different. And part of having a family and having kids was me also giving up part of that lifestyle because it wasn't conducive. You know, you're, you're chasing around celebrity and fame and now you wanna sort of like chase family and kids. You gotta separate it, you know, there's these chapters in your life. You gotta be willing to sort, you gotta be willing to give up something to get the next thing, right? What's it easy to work with actors or musicians? Depends on who it is. Oh, fucking crazy. I made a movie with Jamie Bell. Um, so I made a, made a film called Surrounded that comes out at the top of the year. And it's Letitia Wright, you know, who's in Black Panther and was in Small Axe, but an incredible British actress. And Jamie Bell. Um, and then Michael K. Williams. And Jamie's like, like the most, the coolest, most professional actor I ever worked with in my life. Just like the guy comes to set and he's just like ready to work and he's your friend and he's there to work with you. And some guys come to set, people come to set and they don't want to talk and they're there to do their job and go home and you have to figure out a way to, okay, am I getting the performance I want? How do I talk to them? How, you know, you have six actors in a room and each of them has their own style and their own personality and they have a different way they want to be talked to. And sometimes your job as a director is to just like code switch between each person. You know, you have to be able to talk to everybody differently because they, they respond differently. It isn't sort of unilateral. So that can be complicated. You know, the other thing with actors are is their, how you talk to them, how you communicate with them will determine their ability to stay in character or stay in the flow. Cause sometimes you give them bad direction and you see it in their eyes. You realize that they're getting, they're confused by what you're saying. And, and that's more about like how my confidence or how I communicate. So a lot of, a lot of actors like you know, in monster Jeffrey Wright is like, such a legend and incredible honor to work with him. But every time I approached him, I had to be ready and I had to be really clear. And sometimes that's hard to do in the chaos of chasing your day and trying to get the shot and finish and you want to just bark things at people. Sure, you can do that with ASAP Rocky because he understands, he, he'll communicate that with you. But with someone like Jeffrey, you've got to like calm down, presence, know your thoughts, you know, speak your thoughts, clear. Um, and and less is more too. <laughs> How's this up, Rocky, with the acting? Biggest guy in the room. Is he? Yeah. How did he, how did he make that transition from? I called him when 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 I signed on the monster. You know, monsters are a very famous book. Yeah. And so I called him. I said, "Listen, I'm doing this movie based on this book, Monster." He said, "It's my favorite book. It's the only book I read in high school." Oh yeah. I'm in. Whatever you want to do. So I did a Lana Del Rey video with him where I made him JFK. So um, he owed me. I said, I made you JFK, you owe me forever. And so, so I called him for the film and, and um, he's like, I'm in, I'm in. And so, um, you know, some actors are, are really classically trained and some actors have no training, you know, and, and, and so their, their styles are different. Rocky's just like, his energy, he brings so much. And so his brother was killed when he was young and that was a big defining moment in his life. And, you know, they were, like real street guys. And, and I think it, it turned him away from that life to, to basically music. And he essentially was playing his brother in the movie. So it was, it was easier for him to tap into that. Um, what was challenging was Kelvin Harrison Jr. who plays Steve Harmon because we, he now is a very big actor, but at that point he had only done a couple little things. And so getting him to be able to be number one, essentially on the call sheet. So in every scene of the movie for 20 days, it's exhausting. So with something like Rocky, who has incredible energy and is used to being on tour, someone like Kelvin is not used to being in front of the camera all day and be directed all day and every day learn your lines. It's, it's, a, it's a pace. There's like, you have to pace yourself. It's a marathon. And so Rocky was really kind and sort of like the way he worked, but also his charisma and his, his energy and, and what he brought to the table. You know, incredible. How is that making like, something dark as well? Like, in your mind, like, can you switch off when you go home? Um, no. So how can that drive you insane then? A little bit. Because you, even like actors like Daniel Day Lewis, who the method acting, like I remember watching a documentary as well with Jim Carrey. I think it was a guy, Man in the Moon. He 
he was that character twenty four seven, and it was, and he never got out of it. But he, the documentary says he didn't know who he was anymore. If you're producing something dark as well, that like, dark scenes, like the brain doesn't know what's real or what's fake. Like, do you feel that tension and pressure when you go home? Well, the the biggest amount of pressure on that movie was the fact that it, it's not my story. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a seventeen year old black kid in, in New York who's a victim of prejudice and race and a ju judicial system that wants to see them lose and go to jail. So you, you carry the burden of showing the, the, that book and that story and, and every kid out there that has that story honor, you know, especially as, you know, it's not my story. So the amount of attention to detail and to make sure you're not creating caricatures, make sure that things are real, but you're also pushing the narrative. You're making people think you're taking ch chances. Um, I would go home after a long day and just sit on the couch and just stare at the TV for a couple hours and just, you know, you, go, you, you close your eyes and it's another day and you're back and sort of like you finish late on a Friday night, you sleep half a Saturday, you get Sunday off and Monday you're back in. You know, making a movie is a grind. It's very hard. And then when it's all done, you take a week off and you go sit in a room for five months and stare at monitors. I, I, my eyes were perfect until monsters. I wore <laughs> literally I wore glasses after that movie because uh -huh. you're staring at monitors for, for four months and you're, you know, it's, if, if you want to feel like all the confidence you can have from being a, a visual director, a commercial director, a video director, you go make a movie and you feel like a peasant. You feel like a fraud. You, and, and other days you feel like a king, but most days in an edit you feel like I'm fucking shit like what the fuck why did anybody let me do this because it doesn't work and then slowly you keep trying and you keep trying you start with hundreds of hours of film and you get it down to like you imagine like you start with 200 hours of film and you get it down to 90 minutes so like 80 85 percent of what you shoot hits the ground you're only trying to extract like the best parts of it and so you first try and you get the wrong ones, you put some back and you bring these new ones in. And it's like this constant flow for months at a time. And you get little victories and little victories and you work on something for a week and then you watch it down and you're like, oh, that was shit, fuck, back up. Let's go back to where we were and, and you just try again. And, and people don't talk about that process on how hard that is, the reimagining of a movie. How long did it take to make? You know, the edit process, you, you, the shoot for Monster was 22 days, which is really That's short. Fast, yeah. The shoot for Surrounded was 24 days. Post about the same. It's like it's like four months of editing and then a couple months of, of color and VFX and scoring. And, you know, it's about 10 months on a movie like that. When can you relax once it gets, was it already going on Netflix? Uh, the, well, no, we sold Monster twice. We went to Sundance with it. We sold it out of Sundance. And then we that deal fell apart and then we had to wait. We sold it to Netflix after that. And then we had to wait because of pandemic. So that was a long period, you know. And even now, um, you just never know. You never know what's gonna happen. You make a movie with a partner and you never know what they're gonna do. You've worked with the biggest names on the planet. Was there any you would have liked to have worked with? I mean, in music, like I always want to work with Radiohead and I always want to work Did with you, Madonna. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I love Radiohead, uh, you know, and that, that never worked out and Madonna and some of those, like the Verve. I grew up with those artists, you know. Um, Why the English kind of bands? I just loved, I mean, it was 90s, man. Yeah, drugs don't work and shit. Yeah, Verve were yeah. amazing. Blur, I mean, yeah. yeah. People don't realize that Rich Oasis. Ashcroft is like the biggest Oasis. A Oasis and Blur hated each other. And it's sad that no Gallic and Liam Gallica can't get back that. It's wasted, but maybe their, their albums were timeless at the start then, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Did you ago. ever see when Jay-Z did Glasgow? Yeah, he came out, uh, did he sing Gla Oasis? Glast Glastonbury. Glastonbury. Yeah, yeah. What was it, because was he not getting slaughtered for having an act? It's a great story. So um, so when Jay-Z did Glastonbury, um, I guess, I think it was Liam, Liam who said, this is bullshit, this is a rock festival, what's this hip hop shit? And so like, the, like I would just say the last thing you want to do in the world is pick a fight with Jay-Z. You will lose. There's, he, he's, just, he, he's just too good. So he came out and did Wonderwall, right? And he's told me, he's like, you looked out, there was 250,000 people out there and there was just like a wave of people. And the last line is, you know, don't you know I'm a fucking rock star? And it, it goes into 99 problems. He said the whole crowd just went like this. He's like, that's it, I got him. You know, and it's just... It's it's just you know you gotta again it's it's the pop culture wave if they didn't realize their time was up as big as they are as big as they'll always be it's Jay Z you know times have changed 
You know, why, why do that? Why not just, why not call him and go do the song with him? That would have been even more iconic, you know, if, if, if the, if the, the, it went up and Oasis is there and then Jay-Z walks out and does a song with him, but no, they picked a fight with him. So that's what they get. It's mad. That he, I think he'd done the same with Lewis Capaldi. He was doing, the Scottish kid who was doing it in uh, Glastonbury or T in the Park, but he came out with a jacket on. He came out with like one of the racist jackets that they wear, but he's obviously yeah. got that from yeah. Jay-Z. But I remember that and he, it blew off. And it's again, it's utilizing that negative to a positive. Is that where the genius of Jay-Z comes in? Um, it's, it's chess, not checkers. You know, N the Gallagher was playing checkers, you know, and Jay, Jay played into a lot of things. He did a song that it's like so many levels, right? He did a song that everybody loves. He did it his way. Um, he took a shot at them because they said that he wasn't a rock star. And then he parlayed it into, into 99 Problems, one of his biggest songs. There's so many layers to what he was doing and how he was doing it. And he's just, you know, he just outsmarts people. And that just shows, you know, where he came from. Yeah. You know. What was Justin Bieber on that like? Um, you know, I'm famous for doing the, the, the video with Bieber where he gets beat up, right? Um, when they called me, I said, I'll, I'll do a video only if I get, only if he gets beat up in the video. <laughs> 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 um, he was cool, man. You know, I, he was like in that fluctuation point where he was going from being a boy to a man. You know, he was really like, in that process of of finding himself you know it must be hard for those kids though like so even hard. you look at the uh, one direction harry styles and yeah they, they came do, out okay yeah and they're, they're, they seem to be flying high again yeah but like, you look at them and you kind of think when they break up they're, they're, you're just known as kids but you look at them now their music is quite interesting yeah. a lot of people don't want to admit it because they know them as one direction but yeah. The power of their songs is, is unbelievable. Is there a lot of people, musicians at the top of their craft, take a step back and then start writing music and people yeah. kind of forget who they are, but they're making more money writing, I guess. It's hard. I mean, you know, you think about like, would you put your kids into it? I don't I don't know. My, uh, we've gotten a lot of ink, like people interested in like using my daughter modeling and I don't know. I don't know with what I've seen if I'd want that. You know, it's, you want kids to be kids. Yeah. But at the same time, look at what Justin did. Look what he did for his family. Look what he did for his friends. Look at what he did for music. Um, it's it's no doubt that he's an incredible talent. You know, I just wonder, like, as time goes on, when you're an adult now and you're a father now, how do you, like, step off that machine and actually be present as to, like, for a child? You know, what's your evolution as a man? You know? Yeah. Who's the best name you've worked with? It's interesting because whenever people ask me that, it always goes back to Jay. And the reason why is that is that he's more than just an artist. Most artists are sort of like they're artists. Um, my relationship with Rihanna was like really, really important, you know, because one, I felt like her big brother at one at times, you know, like helping guide her. But then when things got really hard, she always came back to me and we kept working together. And it was like, you sort of like what you're watching somebody become this icon in front of your face, you know? And that was a relationship that was always special to me, you know, like really like to see, she's a billionaire. She's a billionaire, maybe more than one time, which is remarkable compared to the, the little girl that I met in 2005, you know? And so like being able to stand there side by side and then back up and then watch from afar and then get a little closer and stand with them again. And then it's like this interesting relationship of being close to somebody and also being away from somebody and watching them sort of grow into something incredible. Um, but you know, like what's great about my world is that, is that the path continues and there's, there's so many relationships coming, you know, there's new, there's always new adventures and you're it's like where you want to put your creative eye is, is, is where that new path shows itself. You know, so this goes on for as, as long as you stay relevant. Yeah. What you was know? Drake like? Um, well, we didn't talk about Drake at all. You know, I met Drake in 2008. Um, I was doing a video for Mary J. Blige called The One, you know, and he was the feature on it. He showed up with his one of his friends. It was like Oliver, no security. Um, he was just basically making mixtapes. And then when his album came out, he called me. I shot his album cover and I did Over, Miss Me. Uh, find your um, find your love. I did four videos with him, and I watched him find what became his style at that time on set with us. 
Um, he'd never really been shot the way that I shot him. And, and it was cool to like w give him a platform f to take chances and discover. That's when you know it's magic, when you're like, they come to you to do something and you do it and then they step into it and they evolve. So it's not me, it's them. But the moment is what provides the safety, you know? And, um, you know, when then we did a big project with Apple, Cup, we had, you know, we've had our highs and lows. I mean, I just, it's remarkable what he's done. He's a great guy. You know, I'm not, last project I did with him was in 2000, I think 17. We did a, um, a project with Apple and a couple videos and a commercial where it's the bench press commercial, which was a response to the Taylor Swift commercial where she falls on the treadmill. Um, but he's, man, what a winner. He's remarkable. Yeah, including yourself, though, those names is fucking unbelievable. Yeah. You've not just worked with the biggest names, you've also worked with the biggest brands like Nike. And yeah. How, like how do you... How are you treated then around that and that bubble? Like, you must be fucking like like I said earlier that like you've not just worked with these people. You've still built friendships. You've built yeah. trust. You've built bonds. Like you became the brother figure, the father figure. Yeah, you've cared about people who like that's that's the main thing. I think people can feel that. Like if somebody fucking cares, like people just you're just used now nowadays. People just use you, fuck you over, and then you forgot about like with yourself. You've you've stayed with these bonds and created this and created magic that's going to be, like your kids will be watching that and no doubt you'll probably not realise what you've done but when your kid wants to watch something that you've created, mm. it fucking makes you feel good, like yeah. it's special. Like how does, what makes a good music producer? Like how do you become the best? Like what was your ingredients? You're saying as a, as a director or yeah, just in general? just in general. I mean, you know, um, thank you for everything you're saying by the way it's it's nice to hear because um i always say my least favorite day of the year is january 1st because the year starts over yeah you know and you're like okay fuck, what's this year gonna bring and and you know certain years are incredible and other years are just okay and certain years are even bigger than you expect um it takes resilience it takes honesty you have to be able to look at yourself and your work and who you are I've had good times, I've had bad times, I've behaved well, I've behaved badly. You know, I've been kind to people, I've been unkind to people. And getting to a place where you can look back, you know, when you have a dry spell and things aren't working or you're losing jobs, like, then when one comes, you're sort of like, wow, I'm really appreciative of that. That's also, that's also growing up too, you know, being able to appreciate what comes to you versus expect what comes to you. The problem with being a director is that is that you go on these rides that pay you a lot of money, you get all this stuff and you're with all these great people and that's not you. You're still the artist, you still have to perform. You're not the person selling out 20,000 a night. You're the person they've chosen to be part of it, but that can easily be taken away. And when you have it and then it goes away and then you earn it back again, then you, you find a new one and you, right? It's, you learn this process of appreciation, which is really everything, appreciating everything that's happening right now. I mean, last year I was, I was working with Travis Scott a good amount and i was actually in houston when when everything happened at that at astral world when those when those 10 people passed away you know and, and i was working with him on a on an apple campaign and i was directing the live show and it was an absolutely he's an absolutely incredible human being incredible artist like what a talent and then this horrible thing happens that that you, when you see it it could happen to any artist when you're in a show with 60 70 000 people it's like the cup can tilt a little bit, someone can die. And that night, it just happened to be really bad. And, and there were some problems and mistakes, and, but it happened. And, and, and so you look at a guy who's like, worked so hard to get to that level, and now what? What happens? So like nothing is forever and nothing, everything is like, has to be earned, you know? Yeah. And it's sad that because you look at Ariana Grande as well, Manchester. Yeah. Just a young thing. kid, great talent. And then stuff like that happens. That can really send people off the edge. Never recover from and that. Never recover that. Yeah. If you don't think that she doesn't wake up in the middle of the night thinking about people that she does, of course. Because people treat them as objects. They don't see them as human beings. They don't see them being sad or upset or suicidal or have the negative thoughts. Like, I'd imagine that would be the worst of it. Like, nobody sees you as a person, as a human, when they're crying in front of their mum or crying in front of you. Yeah breaking their heart they just see the music video the fancy hair the big cars the jewelry and life is amazing yeah but that's a sad thing i'd imagine about that life to be at that extreme so how was it hard to pull back from the music stuff then like was that 
because you were your wife and you had kids that was it a hard decision why well, i realize that you have to like cannibalize what what is working the most for you in order to get what's next right and so i did it with photography and i i ended up eventually sort of stepped away from being a photographer even though i still take pictures or i still work with clients but not my primary job and with videos i sort of just ran my i had my sort of 10 years you know and you sort of go like it's not going to get any better it's only going to get worse and and do i want to go live that life do i want to be on call because it is a little that you know you get a phone call it's like i need you in new york tomorrow or i need you on a plane tomorrow or i need this right away and you start to you know i met my wife and we we set out to, to have a family and really i was just sort of more into at that point making commercials and working with bigger brands and sort of just doing something different being challenged you know and so it's it's been it was hard for a while to say no but eventually i just my focus just turned this way you know and then i sort of got pulled back in and came back out again i did a I actually did a big video with The weekend and Travis um, and SZA for uh, Game of Thrones. And it was a really tough shoot because of it was connected to the show. And it was one of those sort of like soundtrack songs. And it just, the feeling for me was like, this is tough, man. I got up my head's over here. It's not, listen, if Jay called me or The weekend called me, but you know, as I say to people like, you don't need me anymore. I'm good. You don't need me. You're good. I'm good. You got, there's all these other people here. Everybody should have their time, you know. It's just mad that you've stepped back when you're you at the to, top man. of your fucking craft. You like, that's a big, such a big decision. But like you say, you, you're on speed dial to the biggest names on the planet, and you can make that call if you want to jump back in or not. Yeah, but like I, I'd rather, you know, I go to shows now and put my arm around people, and you know, I always get the, "Are you coming back?" Nope, I'm retired. <laughs> I always get, every time, nope, I'm retired. Who do you, you come know? out of retirement for? Obviously, Jay, but... Who? Well, last week, my wife and I were going to um, the weekend show, and he actually canceled the show like five minutes in because of voice. We had the babysitter and friends, and we just sat down, had a good meal, and, um, you know, it, shows like J&B, you know, stuff like that I'll always catch, you know, but it's always hard with two kids. How hard is it for these artists as well when they start relationships, like Rihanna's and Drake's and fucking Machine Gun Kelly's, like the how did it does it affect them in a relationship after the breaks up breakups as well did it struggle or did it just you say in the personal life yeah yeah you see the big difference with it yeah because what you what you hope is that the music gets better what you hope is that someone like has their heart broken they write a great record you know that certainly happened with rihanna i think that her personal life influenced her her music in a way that it just, I mean, I remember when, like, my favorite video we ever did was Disturbia. And, like, that was the moment where she said to the label, I'm not doing anything except this. You know, I'm painting my nails black. I'm, like, I'm doing all this dark imagery. This is what we're doing. And she paid for the video. And I remember showing to the label, and the label said, um, this is going to ruin her career. And I said, no way. I'm talking to the head of the label. I said, I'll bet you anything. He goes, I said, people love horror movies. So they want to see their idols torn down. She'd been doing the same thing. We've been pushing. This is this is the move. And she was right. And she released the video and it was the biggest video she ever did when we did it. But she took a huge chance and it scared even the people that ran the label that were legends and incredible, you know, visionaries. You know, like in the end of the day, like no one could create Lady Gaga. That's she created that. Right? It's like the greatest artist, the one that survives the test of time are the ones that have something special. And so standing near it and, and feeling that energy and having a little part of it is, is what you, you stand back and you go, okay, that was amazing. That was my time, you know. What about the Kardashians? I don't know. I mean, I haven't worked with them ever. That's mad, isn't it? But the, it's the, incredible. <laughs> what they've fucking done. Yeah, the mom's a genius. Well, she's a, she's a genius. What they've done like, in America, yeah. like, if you're, like I says, Ella, if you're famous, you're proper famous. Like, how do you feel? How about being... what they've done to the rest of the world? I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, what, you walk through Manchester and you see the makeup. It's fucking and the, mad. Like, you go, everybody looks like yeah. them with the skims everywhere. It's incredible. I think that's why a lot of girls struggle, though, because they look at them as tens, but they don't realise the work they've done, they've put yeah. in. And it's scary to think that like everybody lives their best life on social media but it's an illusion it doesn't yeah. exist it's fake yeah but we live in such a, a soft generation that we want to be somebody else instead of creating your own life well i think we saw that with kanye and her you know yeah. you saw their personal life come out and you realize that you know everybody is struggling 
in a way. Everybody has conflict. Just because you're famous and rich yeah. doesn't mean you don't have conflict in your life. How's Kanye? Complicated. Another one, Eminem? Different, but complicated. Like a true genius, but complicated. You know, we did um, Run This Town together and with Jay and uh, Re, and I did a lot of sort of writing with him behind the scenes, stuff that never happened. Um, actually, the first time I worked with him was for the Source magazine. I shot his first cover. Um, when he was really just starting as an artist, um, he, you know, he's like a ball of energy, you know, and you got to be ready to stand next to that. You know, what I hope is that, you know, for me, you watch somebody that has so much creativity, but their behavior is so sporadic. Mm -hmm. And it's like a tough, you can see that he's managing his sort of emotions and his creativity and his chaos in a, in a world that sometimes can't accept that, yeah. you know, and like in the end of the day, what he wants is total freedom from everything. For the world as well. Right, so like, I think we're moving in a direction where a guy like that has enough money and power to set himself up to just be wildly creative. I mean, you see that he just cut his relationship with Gap and he's cutting his relationship with Adidas. You know, he couldn't do that five years ago financially. Now he can. So what does he do? He sets up his own company, his own corporation, his own distribution. He doesn't have to answer to anybody, it's just him. He's one of those guys that needs that. The question is, is like, what's the message to the rest to, to kids? What's the message to other people if that's how you live? Do you think right. he's misunderstood? Because some of the stuff he talks about is, is bang on, but other times I think, fuck, it's a bit far-fetched. But nobody knows what he's actually been through in that lifestyle. I think he's a little mad, though. I mean, I think yeah. he's like a mad genius. I mean, he's clearly one of the great creatives of our time. But, he, you know, fitting into culture is a tough thing to do when you don't want to, when your true rebellion is at, is at the core of who you are. Um, I just, you know, for me, I think about his kids. I think about, like, his kids watching him act that way, you know? And so at some point you have to separate your art from your family, but you got to be able to do both, you know? Yeah. His first two albums were genius. College School Dropout, I think, I think it all was, was unbelievable. Is, yeah, I mean, everything he's done is brilliant. I mean, yeah. like, he's he's incredible. He's the one of a kind. Mm -hmm. For me, he's not my favorite artist to work with because he, creatively he needs a different kind of person than me. You know, I, I know the guys that he works with, most of them, and, and it's right, right? My friend Nabil did a lot of his work. It was the right thing. For me, it didn't work. But every, everybody's different, you know? Yeah. Where do you go forward now with the future, brother? Like, you seem to have ticked a lot of boxes. Like, <laughs> what boxes yeah. you got to tick now? Um, more movies, TV, you know? Um, helping a spirit brand build right now, you know? And... and just keep going, man. Just keep going. It's like, it's almost October. It's going to be January 1st. We start over next year. The year's fucking you know, flying. Huh? The year's flying, man. But, you know, another movie next year, it looks like. Um, and then, you know, every just one step at a time. And just like, what's in front of me right now? You know, we got to keep going. What do you think about talking about your life there? Just with, listen, we've only touched on certain amount of things. You've got so much to talk about. But for yourself, like... Does it make you proud of what you've achieved? Like even listening to that, like the UK listeners and the people who listen will be thinking, fucking hell, that like, it's unbelievable the names you've worked with. Yeah. Like it's second to none. Like, even working with one of those names is enough to to make somebody a yeah. household name. Yeah. You've worked with every single one. Like yeah. how does it make you feel like actually talking about it? Does it make you actually go, Do you know what? Fuck me, I've done okay. I have days like that, yeah. you know, and, and then you sort of go like, wow that part's like you're watching it go down the river a little bit, you know, like as your life goes on, you know, it's like you, time goes. And you, I remember looking at artists that would have shows, retrospective shows, their work from 30 years earlier. And you're like, here's this old man and look what he did in his thirties. And you know, like, what do you do in between? And you sort of go like, well, how do I take every decade of my life and do something interesting with it? You know, how do I keep growing as a person, as an artist, as a man, you know? And yeah, no, I'm proud of, of what, what I did. I am. I am. Sometimes I have to remind myself because you can forget, you know, because there's so much noise and chaos, you know, and you've got to like remember, I, like I just moved and I went through my archive and I was pulling out photos the other day from like 20 years ago. And I was like, like, wow, I don't remember. I kind of remember taking this picture or, or like with my daughter, I'll watch videos that I did. And she'll ask me a lot of questions. She's seven, but just re-explaining what I was trying to do and, and having her understand my creative process. That's where I find so much joy in this. Yeah. You know, it's unbelievable, man. You should be yeah. proud that. Thank you, man. I've got a feeling you're going to end up back in the music game because like, <laughs> of your daughter as well, because we do everything for them. Yeah. Like, 
they'll be yeah. loving some of the artists and yeah. the fact that you can work with them i think that you i think she wants me to work with bts does she that's she the korean <laughs> band, the k-pop band uh -huh. that'd be her dream right yeah now, but BTS. for coming on today brother and giving me your time i thoroughly hey, enjoyed man. that it's my you honor. should be proud thank of everything you, you've done mate it's Likewise, unbelievable man. Thank but you. for anybody that's maybe in the struggle brother or battling like what advice would you have for them take a deep breath you know take a moment and take a deep breath and walk it off because things change fast you know the world moves way faster and and i think we'll oftentimes we create our chaos and we keep spinning it and adding to it and i found that in the most chaotic times of my life i could take my hand off the wheel for a second you know take a deep breath and wait things change yeah. you know brother again phenomenal story phenomenal career thank you the best is yet to come. Again, forgive me your time. It's unbelievable. Anytime, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited that. to watch your success. Thank you. And watch your rise. It's happening fast. I appreciate All that, right, brother. Man. God Thank bless you, you mate. Likewise.